Hello, what a day on which to start my talks on English history because it's the 23rd of April, which of course is St George's Day. I've got my own little memento here, look, my little uh, representation, a bronze representation for the tabletop of St George, complete with him slaughtering the dragon with his lance. That sits on one of our tables. Very interesting subject, St George, because he's filled with fake news, we call it, with myth, with legend. Um, very few people know who he was and I want to answer a number of questions for you today. First of all, why is he the patron saint of England? Who he was? What the legend was and where it came from actually because that's equally interesting. And then perhaps the most difficult question of all, when did he become our patron saint? Now I'm ready to talk about all of that. I've got my notes here to the right hand side. You'll hear me flicking through those occasionally just to keep me on track, make sure I've given you the full story. But to put things in perspective, I think it's important I tell you that actually he's the patron saint of not just England, but of also other states and parts of countries. When you think that the state of Georgia in Eastern Europe was named after our patron saint. Other countries claimed him also as their own, namely Germany, Portugal, Barcelona. Antioch, Constantinople, parts of France and Russia. So it's not just an English thing. But I think our relationship with St George was established in this country between the years 1300 and 1500, a period of immense uh, social change, as we'll see. Now, bearing in mind that this man, if he ever existed, was executed in April 303 AD, there is a question to be answered in that why was it a thousand years uh, had passed before the English claimed him as their special protector? I think I can answer that. In the period 1300 to 1500, there was an enormous amount of social change going on. Citizens in particular are beginning to question the morality of a, an overwealthy overindulgent, greedy and self-seeking church and the clergy who supposedly served that church. The population at that time, of course, was very dependent on the church. And if you think that the, the main interventions uh, which churches made on citizens' behalf was through marriage, uh, baptism and burial, of course, they cost money which people could ill afford, particularly at that time. And when you think about the Black Death which arrived in the 14th century, uh, the, the whole destruction of families must have cost a fortune in terms of burials. I think it was the Reformation that really finally fractured the relationship between us, the English, and the Catholic Church. It also put an end to the Norman style of social organisation we call feudalism. But on the last day of October, in the year 1517, a monk known as Martin Luther, nailed to the door of All Saints Church at Wittenberg in Germany, a series of his written protests. He called them theses. And they criticised the behaviour and conduct of the church, particularly in terms of its wealth and how it occurred uh, secured that wealth. Now this caused an avalanche of protest all over Europe and it ruptured the dominant and cosy position previously enjoyed by the Roman Catholic Church. So now the English who were I think particularly cynical by this point were beginning to listen to what Martin Luther had to say and probably thought to themselves, yeah, there's something in this. There's something in this because they're seeing it for themselves. They're seeing this, um, what they call corrupt behaviour themselves. One thing was being said in the pulpit, they were seeing another behaviour out in uh, the real world. Simultaneously at this, uh, there was a, a, an invention uh, making a huge difference, probably one of the greatest uh, significant changes to uh, European lives of all, 
and that was the printing press. Now, why do I say that? Well, there was a rise of literacy all over England uh, and people could start to read books for themselves, including, of course, the Bible. An um, educated middle class was emerging and this new emerging middle class could actually not only read the Bible for themselves, but they could also interpret it for themselves. And if you think about it, if you wanted access to a document, a manuscript, in the 11th or 12th century, you wanted a copy of it to read for yourself, you had to pay a suitably skilled individual to hand copy it for you, one at a time. Very expensive business. But with the printing press, I can tell you that 300,000 copies of Martin Luther's written theses, all protests against uh, the Roman Catholic Church, were printed and circulated. 300,000. And the words of one man and thoughts of one man suddenly could spread to millions of people within weeks. The middle classes were interestingly purchasing prayer books and paying for private devotions. People started to think and believe that they could speak to God without the intervention of the priests who they didn't always trust. Let's go to the year 1348. I hinted at it a little earlier. The greatest ever threat to humankind landed by the south coast, probably in Dorset, in July of that year, and that was the Black Death. It killed 30 to 45% of our population. And I like to think that it can be compared, if you would, to the nuclear explosions at Hiroshima and Nagasaki because it arrived out the blue, unexpected, and caused losses on an unprecedented scale. And suddenly, as people were dying within days, whole families being wiped out within days, the inadequacies and the self-interests of some members of the clergy, particularly the bishops, were brutally exposed. Now, even the Pope, a man called Clement VI, who at that time resided in Avignon on the south of France, fled, like many other bishops, to his palatial country refuge and shut the door on society so that he was safe, leaving everybody to their own devices. The church at that time simply laid blame for what they called the pestilence on the very people, the citizens, who wanted help. Lay people were told that God was punishing them for their sins. And citizens were prepared to accept that they were being punished. The problem is, they didn't know what they were being punished for. So we've got this loss of trust in the church. And people are starting to seek out uh, a private religion without the intervention of priests who they didn't trust. In short, they were seeking a very much more personal relationship with God, particularly after the Black Death, when they saw for themselves that the churchmen were just as vulnerable as they were. Now this is key, coming back to St George, because isn't the purpose and main function of a saint to act as a steadfast figure or hope or of refuge who, uh, offering a hope of intervention in times of crisis and during the many trials of life, of which there were many in the 14th century particularly. And in this way, the cult of St George did not develop within a vacuum. One has to try and take in the thoughts of a medieval citizen. It's not right for us to judge these issues from a modern perspective. We are educated, we have access to a tremendous amount of information at the touch of a button. We can travel um, around the world when we're free to do so. At that time, the fastest message passed at the rate of the fastest horse, you know. 
It was a very, very different society indeed. And we have to try and put our mind back into the thoughts of a medieval citizen. Now, the point I'm making is that with all the traumas that they had seen, particularly in the context of the Black Death, uh, the Virgin Mary and the saints were actually being identified as real human beings who could intervene on people's behalf. Simultaneously with this, something else was coming to the fore in medieval England. And that was the rise of the guilds. Originally religious, they evolved as agents of craft and trades. The Masons is probably the, the best modern example. Now they were usually associated, of course, with a patron saint and were extremely important to craftsmen and working class people. They had feast days um, when they formally presented their glorious relics of these saints and the, their liveries, which became an issue of great pride. And people began to form up in groups or gangs around uh, the guilds. There were the modern precursors, if you like to think of it that way, as the trade unions, but with knobs on, really. So we've looked at why St George has emerged as a painter and saint, and we've looked at a period of immense social change that is going on. We've looked at uh, this loss of trust and a lack of respect now for the collective church. We've looked at a more literate, questioning population who are being better informed, particularly with the advent of the printing press. Uh, more secular, non-religious works are, are, are available now. And there's also a search for a reliable role models who might intervene on people's behalf in their relationship with God. So we start to turn to St. George. Here we have this search for somebody to intervene. Why St. George? Well, let's have a look at who he was or who he may have been. I think that's as strong as I can put it, really. It is almost impossible for me to separate today the fact from the fiction. But there are certain common denominators in the stories that are passed down to us. We know that George, the name, is Greek for tiller of the soil. Some stories suggest that um, he was a soldier and a governor of Cappadocia. More specifically, that George was a Roman soldier. And that's quite interesting. Because Cappadocia is located in the area of the Black Sea. It's quite possible that um, around the year 270 AD, the man we know as St George was born there, so within modern Turkey. He became uh, a Roman soldier with Christian beliefs, which would have been a very, very challenging proposition at that time, believe me. Now I want to take you to a specific location also on the eastern extreme of the Roman Empire. It's in what is now Turkey, and the place is called Nicomedia. Nicomedia, N-I-C-O-M-E-D-I-A. Now Nicomedia was a residence of a Roman emperor. His name was Diocletian. And in February 303 AD, and that's a significant year, 303 AD, he had his Praetorian guard remove and raise a Christian cathedral in Nicomedia to the ground. The following day, he issued an edict outlawing Christianity, which he had rigidly enforced. The local ruler of that region, a man called Dacian, in order to enforce the emperor's decree, issued a further instruction outlawing Christianity and requiring citizens um, to sacrifice to Roman gods. Well, a certain man, 
George. He defied that decree, disobeyed it. In fact, supposedly he tore it down. For this he was arrested, he was tried, and he was tortured. Eventually he was executed, but I'll come to that in a moment, if I may. The stories that come down to us tell us that he was tortured in one of a number of ways, including the rack, which we are fairly familiar with, being broken on a wheel, a horrendous form of torture, which was widespread at that time, being boiled alive, being sawn in two, being dismembered, being dragged by a horse, and then being given poison. Some suggested that he was killed four times and was resurrected on three occasions. Remember, we're trying to think through the mind of a medieval citizen here. Before we go any further, I just want to mention another medieval concept which would be helpful at this juncture. It was called imitatio Christi, literally in imitation of Christ. Martyrs, to the, uh, for the church were selected because they had imitated Christ in thought and word and deed. So if we think that St George has been arrested, he's been tried, he's been tortured and eventually executed, he's replicating the end of Christ's life, isn't he? The trial, the torment and the crucifixion of Christ. That's how martyrs were selected at that time. Now, I need to take us forward a little bit to the year 1260. Now that's a significant date because in that year, a bishop of Genoa in Italy, he published a book which was effectively a, a catalogue of the history of saints. Now by our standards, it's highly fanciful and full of extremely imaginative concepts and ideas but it held great currency the book that he had published in 1260 was called the golden legend it was the most frequently printed book of its day and about 900 copies of it have survived it was one of the first books actually ever printed in the 15th century by William Caxton now, it was the golden legend which catalogued the story of St. George and gives us much of the um, hyperbole, exaggeration, if you like, and the legend that we're familiar with today. Now, that suggests, collectively, these legends suggest that St. George was eventually executed by beheading and thus martyred on the 23rd of April, A.D., 303. That's why we celebrate St George's Day on the 23rd of April, because that's the day of his execution. So we've got all this source material, and over the centuries it's quite clear that extra material has been grafted on to the bare bones of that legend, and it starts to get fairly extensive, and in some cases probably quite ridiculous. But hold on a minute, because we do have some snippets of what we might call evidence. In the 4th century, a 4th century historian called Eusebius, who was the Bishop of Palestine, gives us written proof confirming the martyrdom of a man who he doesn't name. The man was of high rank. He tells us that he tore down a decree which outlawed Christianity. And he confirms also that the man suffered terribly and that he bore his torment with great courage. I can also tell you that the oldest known image of St George comes from a 6th century Byzantine icon of the Virgin Mary with saints and angels. So his story definitely does go back some way. Now, for our purposes, in the 4th century, the Roman Emperor Constantine, very, very famous for furthering Christianity, he erected a church 
over a tomb and now a shrine at a place called Lydda, L-Y-D-D-A, now known as Lod, which is about nine miles from Tel Aviv in modern Israel. So he erects this church there and we know that as early as the 6th century the French had been venerating relics of St George. And the Crusades gave great impetus to the legends. There were stories about St George appearing to help Christian warriors at, at key moments of their battles and their invasions of the Holy Land. cathedral is placed over the site of that tomb and if you look on my Facebook page I will drop in for you a photograph of that tomb and that shrine which has survived. So we're starting to get some idea of who this man was or purports to be but the best known part of the legend, and one that I certainly remember from ever since I was a schoolboy, was not just St George, but he's always synonymous with the dragon, isn't he? Now that episode was not recorded before the 10th century. So we know it's a relatively recent addition. We talked about the golden legend from the year 1260, and that certainly talks about the dragon and by the 13th century this dragon episode is very well established the two are synonymous what has happened by this time is that the story of St George has become fixed as the idea of a courageous and chivalric warrior saint He's a soldier saint, a soldier's protector, if you like. And medieval images uh, um, which survive make obvious his status as a soldier saint. He's dressed in the armour. And again, if you look at my Facebook page, I'll drop onto there one or two medieval images. There's a famous one by Raphael, the Renaissance artist. And there's also an altarpiece in modern day Ghent, which features St George alongside Mary. Mary and George are often portrayed together. George becomes more, um, Mary's warrior saint. And we'll, we'll have a look at that again in a moment. What is the story of the dragon? Well here we do get into the realm of fantasy and, and uh, a myth here but let's tell it how it was bearing in mind what I said about thinking through a medieval person's mindset. The dragon was supposedly threatening a Libyan city called Silene, S-I-L-E-N-E. Silene or Silene in Libya. The dragon threatened the community and demanded to be fed at least one sheep and one child per day, otherwise it would attack the city. But soon the supply of children and sheep began to dry up. The king realises that next in line to be fed to the dragon, of course, is his daughter, the princess. But he wants uh, his daughter to be spared. But the people revolt if the princess doesn't take her turn. So she and the sheep are offered in the usual way to the dragon and she is said to have been dressed as a, a bride as she walks out to meet her terrible, terrible fate. Suddenly on the horizon comes St George to intervene. He attacks and wounds this evil dragon. He wounds it. He passes the dragon on a leash to the princess who leads it back to Silene. There, George gets the occupants of the city to convert to Christianity, after which he slaughters the dragon. And having killed it, he nobly refuses the princess's hand in marriage and rides off 
after refusing offers of a reward. Now these remarkable episodes to us are portrayed in several uh, medieval and Renaissance paintings. As I say, the best one I think is by Raphael. I'll drop a few of those into my Facebook site for you. Now interestingly, in his um, the medieval sources, George is identified by his personal crest, which is, of course is a red cross on a white background or field is the correct word. And in this way, he has become a soldier of Christ, an ideal of heroic chastity, and it's all boiled down to um, a battle between humans and beasts, good versus evil, and chastity versus promiscuity. This is all bound up in the story of St George and the Dragon. And the legend, and here we go again, is personifying religious teaching. In that a chaste woman, in this case the Virgin and Princess, has been rescued from sexual evil in the form of the dragon by the embodiment of chastity and nobility in the form of Saint George. It's quite interesting when we think for just for a moment about dragons because we've got two forms in the world today. If we look at the Western world, dragons are monstrous, evil, fire-breathing, um, evil uh, beings. In the East, it's an entirely different story. They're gentle, they're beneficial, and they're positive. Tales of dragons have been claimed by several countries and places, not least of all England. Certainly, I can tell you the Bible contains a description of a dragon-like monster. The last book of the New Testament is Revelation, and that describes a dragon with seven crowned heads and ten horns, would you believe? In the 10th century in England, we had an Anglo-Saxon poem. Many of you will be familiar with it, Beowulf. That ends with the story of a king in a battle with a dragon. And many legends around the world talk of a hero rescuing a princess from some form of monster. Dragons were very, very real to incredulous and illiterate citizens. And I can tell you that in England, and Wales actually, there were sighting, sightings of dragons as late as 1614. And you know something, before we rubbish thoughts of dragons, Let's just have a look at some pretty recent events when monsters, inverted commas, have been discovered. And it's only in very, very recent years, certainly within the last century, that we've been able to confirm the existence of very strange creatures like the narwhal, a whale-like beast with this tremendous unicorn corn-type horn. Um, the Komodo dragons, that's a fairly recent discovery. In Patagonia, uh, modern-day Argentina, haven't they just discovered an immense dinosaur, much, much bigger than even a T-Rex? Something we would have thought was completely fanciful as nonsense, but it's not. And uh, that replicates very much the way in which uh, medieval citizens thought. I'm going to look now at one of the most difficult questions of all, really. When did George become the patron saint of England? Well, we do know that Anglo-Saxon churches were dedicated to him. Um, the oldest surviving portraits in England of St George are at uh, a church uh, known as the Lewis Group of Wall Paintings at Hardham, off the A29 London to Christchurch Road near Lewis. We know that in the year um, 1195, Richard I, otherwise known as the Lionheart, invoked St George during the Third Crusade as his personal protector. Now we're not saying here that St George has become suddenly the patron saint of England or that his emblem has become the flag of England. It hasn't, certainly not at that stage. What we're saying is that Richard I has invoked him as his personal soldier saint to protect him during the Crusades. 
very, very difficult for us to identify one specific date when St George became our patron saint, but there are certainly steps in the process that we can identify. The first I'd like to point out is that in 1265, English soldiers carried the Red Cross as a military ensign when they fought on behalf of Henry III against the barons at the Battle of Evesham in Worcestershire. Now bear in mind we're talking 1265. Five years earlier, 1260, we've had the publication of the Bishop of Genoa's Golden Legend. There is a written reference in England to St George and it dates to 1351. It says this, the English nation call upon St George as being their special patron, particularly in war. Now this is quite interesting because it's three years after some significant events have happened in England, which I'll touch on now. In the year 1348, our great warrior king Edward III has founded the Order of the Garter, now the oldest order of chivalry in the world. And who was their patron saint? Saint George. Now the Order of the Garter was comprised of a brotherhood, if you like, of 24 chivalric knights, similar in many ways to the company of King Arthur's legendary 24 Knights of the Round Table. Concept was very similar and the king did it for that reason really. St George's Chapel is built alongside Windsor Castle as a focal point for the order. And once that chapel was absolutely filled with relics and imagery of St George, but much of that has been lost. What we do know is on the 23rd of April 1349, the year after the foundation of the Order of the Garter, St George's Day it was formally celebrated as an official feast day. I can tell you that in the year 1399, St George's feast day became a public holiday. And then we come to another key step in the process, the famous Henry V and the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. Now, Shakespeare, of course, attributes the very famous phrase to Henry V, probably imaginary, but Henry V supposedly says, Cry God for Harry, England and St George. But what we do know is that prior to the Battle of Agincourt, English citizens back home have been urged to abstain from servile work, to attend church and to pray to St George for the safety of King Henry during the forthcoming campaign. The saint was supposedly seen by uh, the English armies before that famous battle. We know that the will of a later king, Henry VII, Henry Tudor, the first of our Tudor monarchs, showed that he possessed a relic, namely a portion of St George's leg. I bet that was smelly. <laughs> And there are images of the saint and the dragon on the glorious tombs of Henry Tudor and his wife Elizabeth of York in Westminster Abbey. So let's go back to the Tudor age because now Henry VIII becomes a very significant figure. It is fact that Henry VIII issued coins incorporating images of St George and images of St George and the dragon featured on parts of Henry VIII's uniform. He was a hugely important figure was Henry VIII in the legend of St George because it was during his reign which is 1509 to 1547 that the white flag uh, with the red cross in the centre becomes established as the true flag of England. There is no specific single date but certainly during the reign it's become established. 
And of course, where was Henry VIII buried in 1547? Although that was more to do with the relatives of his wife, Jane Seymour, he was buried beneath the choir in St George's Chapel. In the 15th century, so that's during all the uh, 1400s, we know that 193 churches in England were dedicated to St George. The guilds were performing social and civic functions on behalf of their members and St George was featuring heavily. The best known and longest surviving records of those festivities date back to 1385 and they go back to Norwich which has records of the celebrations uh, for over well over a hundred years. There were very solemn ceremonies, always on the 23rd of April, of course. They were called ridings. Uh, there were really glorious affairs in which everybody dressed up, you know. And this was very important to citizens of the day. But come the Reformation, and particularly the dissolution of the monasteries between 1536 and 1540, when Thomas Cromwell oversaw the smashing of all of our monasteries and abbeys, there is much, much less support for St George and the celebrations. The reason being that reformers were very keen to exorcise myth and superstition from church liturgy. Coming to more recent centuries, we do know that the... Uh, stories about St George, his heroic nature, his chivalric uh, principles were very act uh, attractive actually to English pre-Raphaelite artists and you'll see many images of St George in their work. In 1971 the supposed skull of St George was discovered in an abbey on the island of San Giorgio in Venice. In 1894, the Royal Society of St George was founded. Very, very busy for me, less so nowadays. And then in 1908, the Scouts movement was founded by Baden Powell. And who do they have as their patron saint, of course? Well, Baden Powell wanted young men to value chivalrous conduct. And at that time, from the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, the concept of chivalry was very important in English society when it was felt that young men in particular were losing their way. St George was the most useful icon through which um, better behaviour could be promoted and uh, principles expressed. And I think the final nail on the coffin perhaps comes in May 1969 when the Roman Catholic Church formally reduced St George's feast day to the level of an optional local festival. In other words, he leaves it to us here in England. I think that was probably the death knell. Today, he has very little relevance to our day-to-day -day lives. I think it's a shame that some of the principles behind him haven't survived. I think we need them, particularly during the current crisis. And I live here in Nottingham, and I think it's quite interesting to compare the legend of St George with another legend that is quite um, significant to my home city, and that's the legend of Robin Hood. If we think about what Robin Hood stood for and the stories that have been attributed to him about robbing the rich to pay the poor, etc., etc., I think it matters not whether St George as an individual or Robin Hood existed, it is what they stood for that matters. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I look forward to speaking to you again soon.